your Bible to the book of Philippians. Book of Philippians, chapter 4, we're going to read verses 6 through 9. My message is entitled, Overcoming Anxiety. I think it's appropriate right now, considering all that's going on in the world today. What do you think? Overcoming Anxiety, Philippians chapter 4, and verses 6 through 9. Let's all stand up to the reading of God's Word. Speaking to the church of Philippi, he says this, beginning with verse number 6. My beloved, before I read this, I really think I can help you. Not, it's not me, because I'm going to give you the Word of God today, but I really think it can help you. I, it's going to be a two-part message. There's no way I wanted to give you all one lump, but we'd be here until after the nursing home ministry. So we can't do that. But I want you to pay attention because, listen, this is for your benefit, my benefit. It helps me, okay? So I, I, all of us at some point may have a problem with anxiety, some more than others. So I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you today because anxiety can cause a lot of problems in you. All righty? So Paul says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received, and heard, and seen in me. Now, Paul's using himself with the example here, amen? He says, do it, and the God of peace shall be with you. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the infallible book you've given us. Lord, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the principles that are in this word. Father, I pray that I can help some folks today and when I finish this message. I pray, Lord God, you'd anoint the Word of God, that you'd help people set aside some things and start thinking about what the Spirit is saying to their hearts and minister to them, Father. And those who need deliverance, deliver them. Heal them, O God. Encourage them. Draw them closer to the foot of the cross. Ancient words, as the choir sang, strong and true. Father, anoint this preacher. Give me physical strength this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, before we begin into this sermon, what I want to be able to do is give you a little backdrop and context of this epistle. Now remember, this epistle right now, the epistle to the Philippians, is one of his prison epistles. So Paul's writing this epistle from a jail cell. Now, beloved, Paul and his companions founded the church at Philippi at, on his second missionary journey. This was the first church that was established on the European continent. And, of course, the, um, Philippi is in modern-day Greece today. And when Paul was ministering at Thessalonica, that's also in Greece, what the church at Philippi did was support him again and again so he'd be able to uh, minister the Word of God without having to disrupt was doing and going out and getting a secular job. So they understood how important it was for an apostle of God, anointed by God, to go out and proclaim the word of God. And so they said, okay, we can't have the preacher doing that. He won't get the word of God out. And beloved, that's perfectly in alignment with Acts chapter 6. Remember when the first uh, deacons were ordained, uh, the apostles said, look, pick ye out seven men among you, full of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. And he says, we can't give ourselves a waiting on tables. God's called us to pray and minister Word of God. It wasn't it was below them, it's just that wasn't their calling, their gift. Nobody else had the apostolic calling like that. So Paul understood this church at Philippi had done a lot for them, beloved. They were a good church, and they were a generous church, but it was also a church that was plagued with many problems. In fact, if you read this epistle, Paul makes allusions to this all over the place. For example, beloved, they suffered persecution from without. They faced internal strife and disunity from within. The Bible says they were beset by some false teachers who would join the church. And what they 
started doing now was attacking the cross of Christ. Paul said, some do it out of contention, some do it out of sincerity, some add more affliction to my bonds. But nevertheless, he said, I rejoice and that the gospel is being preached. Would you say amen out there? And moreover, beloved, because of their stand for Christ and because of all of their problems, they also had to struggle themselves to meet their own uh, basic needs and necessities of life. In other words, they were struggling just to put food on the table, just to put some clothes on their back, some shelter, a roof over their head. They were struggling just to survive. Why? Because they were Christians. You hear me now, when they embraced Christ as their Lord and Savior, many of them lost their families. Many of them lost their friends. Many of them lost their homes and their jobs. Unfortunately, many of these Philippian Christians lost their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, beloved, when you, take a stay, when you take a stand for the Lord, Satan goes to work. When you preach the word of God, Satan goes to work. Satan will do anything he can to disrupt the preaching and teaching of the word of God. So these Philippians had taken a stand for God, and they were being persecuted. You see, Satan's demonic cohorts, his nefarious followers, ruthlessly and relentlessly attacked him in every area of life imaginable with all kinds of hardships and difficulties, beloved, with all kinds of problems. Why did he do it? Because he was trying to get the Philippians to reject and renounce the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately destroy their church. But praise the Lord, they didn't. These Christians took a stand for Christ. Would you say amen? And it cost them plenty to do it. Imagine, beloved, would you take a stand if your job was on the line for Christ? Would you lose your home for Christ? Would you sacrifice everything you have for Christ? I hope I can say amen. I mean, but you know, it's, there's a difference between theoretical knowledge and experiential, isn't there? And it goes to show you what kind of a commitment these Philippian Christians had made with the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, beloved, they were pagans, and they got converted to Christ. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, therefore, when Paul who was locked up in a Roman prison cell himself for the cause of Christ, beloved. When he heard about their troubles, Paul immediately puts pen to parchment and he writes them this letter from his jail cell to thank them for their support, but especially to encourage them in the faith and encourage them in the trials they're going through, even though he himself was in the midst of a real trial. Beloved, he could have had his head lopped off then, not later. He had that done in 67 A.D. But he could have had it then uh, because a Roman, uh, Paul was a Roman citizen, and Roman citizens were not to be crucified. They could die the easy way with your head lopped off. Imagine that. But anyways, beloved, when you look at Paul, with all that he went through, with all the pain, all of the pressures, beloved, with a contorted and distorted body, with scars all over him, probably some teeth knocked out, from being stoned. Oh, beloved, what an ebullient and indomitable spirit Paul had in Christ. And beloved, as we read this epistle, we see that it abounds with faith. It abounds with hope. It abounds with joy. It abounds with rejoicing, despite all of the problems he and they were in. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, let me tell you something. If you're in a battle for Christ, and your feet are being put in the fire, and you're suffering, praise God that you're counted worthy to suffer for Christ. Would you say amen? For example, let me give you an example about Paul's ebullient spirit. Even though Paul was in jail for the cause of Christ, and even though these Philippians themselves were in the midst of all kinds of problems for the cause of Christ, Paul still says this to, to them in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Paul, are you serious? You want me to rejoice in my suffering? Rejoice that I'm homeless? Rejoice that I don't have any food? Rejoice that I don't have a job right now. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, you say what? Rejoice. Hallelujah. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I want you to rejoice in your trials for the cause of Christ is what he's saying. Rejoice in your hardship and in your adversities for the cause of Christ. Rejoice in your difficulties and in your woes and in your sufferings for the cause of Christ. For this proves you are a true Christian. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, God always causes his people to triumph over all things in Christ. No matter what it looks like externally, beloved, listen, and this world is passing away. 
And God says, you're not. You're not. You can lose everything you have here. You have gained eternal life. I'll make sure I cause you to triumph in Christ. And Isaiah 54, 17. Isaiah says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Would you say amen out there? What's he saying? He's saying, in other words, the battle is the Lord's. Come on and say amen. He's saying the battle is the Lord's. And that he assures his faithful people that they'll always be victorious in Christ and in the spiritual battle, beloved, and they'll over all their foes. Listen, I can overcome my enemy by death. I can overcome my enemy by life. I can overcome my enemy with love. I can do a lot of things to overcome my enemy. Amen? But a lot of people think you mean you're going to beat him to death. You're strong. He is. Or you defeat him in the battle. You are. But it's a spiritual battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing to captivity every thought and to the obedience of God. Say amen. amen. You see, beloved, you can't fight a spiritual battle with physical weapons. You must use spiritual weapons. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the Bible tells us. So, beloved... God says, no weapon that's formed against you so prosper. Uh, you know, beloved, even though Paul was encouraging them, and even though they probably knew everything I'm saying to you right now, nevertheless, the fact of the matter is this, is that the raging spiritual battle that these Christians were now in was fierce and it was hot. Now, it's different when you've gone through the fire and you can look back and say, whoo, how did I do it? Well, you're in the middle of it. You say, how am I going to do it? <laughs> Amen? You see, beloved, what are you saying to me? I'm saying they had been confronted with every conceivable trial and trouble and tribulation and temptation to quit there was. In other words, they were facing persecution. They were facing ridicule and abuse. They were facing all kinds of threats. Imagine your boss coming up to you and saying, look it, I don't care if you're a Christian, you're a Sabbath-keeping Christian. You don't work on Saturday, your job's on the line. You know what a lot of people will do? They'll say, okay, I'm working, I'll lose my job. Listen, lose your job. Better than lose your soul. You know better now. Amen? God will take care of you. The God who saved you will take care of you. Beloved, they were surrounded by danger and distress and difficulties. They were surrounded by false teachers. Imagine Paul preach and then someone come in the church and try to undo everything that he said. Try to dissuade them. Oh, don't be so foolish. He's just a, one of those pharisaical religious nuts. And so they were undoing everything Paul has. They were surrounded by hostilities. And beloved, they were surrounded by poverty. They did not know even where their next meal was going to come from. None of us know here. What I, the clothes that you have on your back are the only clothes that you own. That's what was happening to the Philippians. And that's why, beloved, in the Bible, the, the Bible says that even a Jew under the law if he owed you something and you gave him your cloak on the outside, he could keep it for the day. At nighttime, the Bible says, or God said, you must return it unto him because that's how he keeps warm. That's his life. In the morning, you take it off again and you give it back to the man you owe money to. So you get these Christians, uh, the Christians. <laughs> that's the original Portuguese version. You can see what these Christians were going through. <laughs> Therefore, beloved, Paul knew this, that generally speaking, or I should say probably humanly speaking, that is in the flesh, the natural response and reaction for most people would normally be for them to now fear, to them to now fret, to worry, to panic, for them to now suffer anxiety, beloved, and be so disturbed, so uneasy and troubled that they'd be miserable and despondent in their walk with the Lord, and they would lead a dread filled Christian life for God. A lot of people are walking around with their hands in their pocket, their head down on their chin. Oh, is me. I can't believe it. I've lost my job for Christ. I thought he was supposed to. On and on. But the Christ Philippian Christians didn't do that. I would too. I'm human. You're human. I want to know where my next meal is coming from. I want to know I got a roof over my head. 
No, no, I've got a place I can live in to put my feet up. How about you? So I want you to see that these folks are in the midst of a real spiritual battle, and the, being a Christian costs them a lot. It hasn't for a lot of us in the country yet. But all over the world, as we pray week after week, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer as ver- adversity, also yourselves in the same body with them. Hebrews 13, 2. Remember them that are in bonds. Because you're in the same body with them. When they're bound, you're bound. When they weep, you weep. When they rejoice, what? Rejoice with them. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? Well, Paul writes this letter. Why does he do it? Because he wants to remedy and reverse these painful emotions. Painful emotions of anxiety that he knows will overwhelm them. It will control them. And it will us also. It will overwhelm us. Full of anxiety all the time. That's why people get stressed out with drugs and booze. They're always overwhelmed with anxiety and they're controlled by it. So Paul here shows us God's way of supernaturally dealing with all of these things. With fret, worry, anxiety. Now I have three points, but I'm only going to give you two points today. And only half of the second point. The rest of the message I'll give you not next week, but the week after. I will show you how to really deal with anxiety. But I want to be able to show you what Paul's leading up to here. Amen? So the first thing I want you to see is the, obsess- the problem of obsessive anxiety. The problem of obsessive what? Anxiety. Okay, I want you to look at verse 6a. Paul says this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6a. He says, be careful for nothing. Now, why did Paul say to them, be careful for nothing? Let me tell you why. Because this shows they were careful for everything. They were anxious about everything, ladies and gentlemen. And that's understandable. They didn't have a welfare system like today. They didn't have a social security office that they could go in like today. They didn't have hotels down the street like you can go in today. They didn't have state programs to take you off the street and up for the night because it got too cold out like they do today. So you can understand, and I can understand, why they were careful about a lot of things or anxious about a lot of things. So Paul here now echoes the Lord's Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 25, 34, where Jesus told us this. He says, take no thought about what you eat. Take no thought about what you drink. Take no thought about what you wear, what you're putting on your body. And he says, take no thought about what may happen tomorrow. Now listen to me. Take no thought about what you It's not so much what you're eating, but what's eating you. Do you hear what I said? you got anxiety. It isn't so much what you're eating. It's because of what is eating you. And when something eats you, beloved, it stimulates all kinds of bad hormones in your body. They can ruin you. Your brain secretes all kinds of things. But more than that, you start doing things to try to appease that anxiety, like taking drugs like drinking uh, alcohol, like doing all kinds of things. Why? Because you have what? Anxiety, beloved, and you're careful for a lot of things. You can't deal with a lot of things. So Jesus says, take no thought about what you eat or drink or what you wear or fear about tomorrow. He said, because these things, if you're a Christian, will take care of themselves and sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What did Jesus mean by that? In other words, Jesus is telling his disciples, I do not want you to worry. I don't want you to be overly concerned about any of these things like the unsaved people of this world who know not God are. They think they have to fend for themselves. I need to do it. I need to have a job. I need to get the insurance. I need, I need, I'm going to do this. Instead of, Lord, help me. Lord, you can do anything. Lord, uh, open the doors for me. You see, that's the way the unsafe uh, world is, and that's why I tell you, be careful watching TV and social media, because they're, they're thinking they're supporting themselves, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, and you ought to do this, and you've got to do that. And, and you see, beloved, what they want you to do is fall into the same anxiety that they're in, as if there is no God. And that's what they're trying to do, and they brainwash you. That's this evil world system that Paul speaks about. So they're obsessed about what they eat. And they're obsessed about what they drink and what they wear and what they think the future holds, beloved. And nothing from Paul's day to right now has changed, beloved. Just look around you. People are so obsessed about their diets today. 
I can't eat that. I can't eat this. I ought to eat this. I ought not to eat that. You know, if you lived in Jesus' day, you just kind of walk around. If something didn't agree with you, you just didn't eat it, right? <laughs> Me, I've got a stomach like a trash masher. I could eat that couch and it'd be all right. <laughs> but if it didn't agree with you, don't eat it. But don't worry about it. And people today are worried about what they drink. If I have that and I don't have this, you know what? This is one of these high energy drinks, and I really need it. Of course, you don't know there's 400 milligrams of caffeine in your house going to go. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. You're wired, right? <laughs> Years ago, I, I was preaching, and someone came afterwards, and they said, Pastor, this is, I'm not saying this because I, I didn't know it was Pastor Appreciation Month. Okay, I just found out. But that's the thing. It's Pastor Appreciation Month. And I took out a bottle, a can, they gave it to me. I read it, and it said, Jolt. I never heard of it. I said, Jolt? And I looked at the can, and it said it had caffeine in it because it didn't tell you how much. And I, I was working that day. I was, this when we were at the warehouse. And uh, I got through with someone. I said, you know what? I said, I've just had it. I've just talked out. I'm, I'm exhausted. I was like a dish rag. I said, I think I'll just, and I'm not a soda drink. I never, I, I, I don't drink anything stronger than coffee drinks ever than you could. But I'm not a, I don't drink a lot of tonic. But anyways, I opened up. I went, <laughs> and I was thirsty. Ah, it's not bad. <laughs> I didn't sleep for a week. <laughs> no one told me how much caffeine there was in there, right? I mean, I never, in all the exercise of kung fu I ever did, my heart never beat that fast. Even when I was in combat, it never beat that fast. And so I don't recommend that you, but people are worried about what they're drinking. And you know, you've got to have the right clothes to put on so people will look at you. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. Do I look good in this? Look good to who? If you're married later, you don't look good to your husband. If he says you don't look good, change it. Put that burlap sack back on. <laughs> Chiefs cave, you don't have much of a wardrobe, right? I'm not trying to look good for you. I'm not trying to look good for I want to look good for the Lord and for, uh, 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 what's my wife's name? Uh, her. Beloved, it's amazing. I was saying to Ellie last night, it amazes me. People dress up to go to the White House, right? They dress up to go to a party. They dress up to go to a wedding. They dress down to go to church. Man, you wouldn't dress like that in front of the president, but the God of the universe, they think nothing of it. In other words, their value system is what? It's warm. It's turned right upside down. And people don't understand that. And when I'm coming to the house of God, I'm not coming casually. I'm coming because I'm going to be in a spirit of worship. Now, if all a person has, I'm just saying, beloved, it's something. Roddy was God to certainly accept that. But you know what? If you start serving God, he'll start increasing your wardrobe. He did it to me. I never owned a suit. Someone got me one. I walked in my bathing suit. And when I went like that, I went this way. <laughs> like a soggy cherry, I told you. But, beloved, people are so worried about the future, yet Jesus tells us not to worry about any of these things. Why, Lord? Because it says, your Heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you even ask Him, and He, in His divine providence, promises He will provide it for you. If all you've got to eat, I told you, is a can of beans, God will sanctify that can. And by the way, beans, you say beans? Beans, beans, the be no, I won't sing it to you. Okay. Beans, high in protein. High in carbohydrate, high in sugars, natural sugars. They're good for you. You see, beloved, what I'm saying, they can sustain life. It's a high-protein food. People put it in their salads. People put it in all kinds of things, in their soups. But it's a combination of protein, carbohydrate, and uh, uh, fructose. Not glucose, fructose. But all I have to say is that people are so worried about everything, and yet God, in His wisdom, made foods that have broccoli, and it has uh, the, all the cruciferous vegetables. They've got vitamin K, and they overlap. And one, in case you don't get this, but you get that today. And yet you're still getting what you need, right? God in his wisdom knows what he's doing. But what the world is saying is, don't eat that. The most miserable thing you can. Remember when they were saying, don't eat eggs? I got into fights with my professors over this. I said, I want to tell you something right now. The Bible says God ate eggs. God made eggs. Job said there was no flavor in the white of an egg, and I want mine with flavor, so I like the yolks. How about you? There's no yolk, I'm telling you right now. I like mine with a lot of yolk in it. And I like about three of them at once. 
and I wish my doctor was here because I just had my blood test. And he says, well, he's been telling me for two and a half years, come and get your physical. Come. I said, I will, I will, I will. Finally, he hounded so much. One Sabbath, he said to me, come up here two Sabbaths ago. Two Sabbaths ago, come up. I've already made an appointment for you on Monday the 8th. I says, okay, Eatros. That's the, that's the, I call him Eatros because that's the Hebrew, a Greek word for doctor in the Bible. And I said, if you want to speak to me in Hebrew and Greek, it's poimen, that's pastor. But anyways, I says, okay, Eatros, I'll be there. I got my, my, he says, your blood is perfect. He says, what do you eat? I says, you don't want to know. <laughs> really? I, I, you know what it is? It's saying grace over it and eating it in the right spirit and knowing God, I'm thankful for what God gave me. I, and I try to eat good food. We all try to do that. But what I don't do is go nuts. When I even hold my health food store, people say, I'm afraid to invite you over. We may, I said, listen, I eat anything. I put your hand there. I eat your hand too. <laughs> I'm not a fanatic like that. Never been. I'm not a person that's obsessive compulsive. That's not me. Whatever God gives me, I eat. But I try to eat good food. I eat a lot of fats. I love fat. I, and it, Anybody's on a low-fat diet going to keep you fat. But all that to say, if you're on a low-fat diet, you get no taste in you, and you must be having it anyway. So. <laughs> Ellie comes home yesterday. For, I mean, she came home with children. Whole-fat yogurt. Yeah, that's right, girl. Whole-fat cutting. Uh-huh. Come on. Pour it. Whole-fat milk. Come on now. And if I have, I usually drink my coffee black, but if I have it with cream in it, you know what I put in it? I put whipping cream and a pat of butter. Now, my triglycerides were great. My cholesterol, I don't worry about cholesterol. I, I, I believe that the most fun, you know, I won't get into it because I don't want to. I'm talking about diet, though, but all I'm saying is people being brainwashed today. Cholesterol is not the criminal. It's found at the scene of the crime because your inflamed arteries get homocysteine like a fishnet, and the cholesterol globule can't get through it. And there's two types of HDL and LDL, and I won't go into that with you. But the point I'm getting at, beloved, is this here. Do you think I'm sitting down saying, let's see, how many carbohydrates am I having right now? How much starches am I having right now? I read that book. You know what they said in that book, that I shouldn't put this together with that. Don't combine that with this. Right here. Beloved, if combining foods upset you, don't combine them. But use your common sense. Amen? Don't do it just because someone's trying to scare you. There's things that you can't eat. You can't. My father was like a cow. What do you mean? I think he had two stomachs. Whenever he ate cucumbers, a half hour later, he goes, burp, burp. oh, Dad, you need to be chill. Well, I can't stomach cucumbers. Well, why are you eating them? He's because I like them. <laughs> but he'd burp them up a half hour later, right? He'd still be chewing it, right? So I said, Dad, come on. <laughs> but, beloved, the point I'm trying to get you is this here. God knows what it is that you need to live. And we've so focused on the horizontal that we've taken our eyes off of our vertical father who was our provider. And Paul went on. Book of Philippians right here, beloved, in verse 19, he says, But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Would you say amen? amen? My God will do that. How about your God? Will your God do that? Or are you going to do it? You worry about it? Jesus sent his apostles always to take with you no script, don't take a bag with, don't even take any food with, not even another change of sandals. Wherever you go, anybody walks in the house, go in there. Let your peace be in there. And eat whatever they set before you. Oh, no. I know I haven't eaten in three days, but this isn't organic meat right now. It isn't grass-fed, so I can't eat it. Yeah? I said, give me that and give me more. Are you guys any more in the kitchen in the pot? <laughs> you go ahead and stop. I'm going to eat. I want the calories. I want the nutrition, don't you? Any port in the storm. And people around the world eat worse than we do, and they live longer. How's that for you? Okay. The problem is they eat less. Or the... Anyways, beloved, so Paul said, because of this, because God's going to provide all of your need according to his riches and glory of Christ Jesus, Paul uses the phrase, be careful for nothing. Memnahu medais is that phrase. And he does this to reiterate, reinforce, and remind them of what the Lord had already taught them about this. And it literally means this, be careful for nothing. It means to take no thought or be troubled with cares, to not be worried to not be fretful, to not be uh, uh, anxious of anything or anyone, just like Jesus said. Now, why did Paul say that? Because Paul had spent time at the church of Philippi, and he had taught them the Word of God. Now, listen to me, beloved. Why did he say that? Because God has your back. Did you hear that? 
Why did he say that? Because God is in sovereign control over your life. Would you say amen? Why did he say that? Because God is your divine protector. He is your divine provider. Not your bank account, not your job, not your boss, not you. God is in his divine providence. Why did he say that, beloved? Because he understood that God in his supernatural power and promises, uh, providence promises that he is going to take care of us. You know, kids don't worry about where their next meal is coming from. You know why? Because they already think mommy and daddy is going to what? I want you guys to get to work and get, stop paying your own way. You know? And that's the way we're supposed to be with God. And I'm not telling you to be ignorant about what you're eating, okay? What I'm trying to tell you to do is stop worrying about what you're eating. Because it's eating you by you worrying about what you're eating. And God says, don't worry about that. But a lot of people do. Why? Because they've read something. I saw what that said on the internet. Yeah, and I don't say heathen atheists are saying, don't do that, don't do that. Why? Because I studied the account saying the New Age, and the New Age says, and the earth people, and you shouldn't be doing that right now. We're all vegetarian, we're green weenies, and this is what we do. It's amazing, isn't it? People are shaking like the weed in the wind. Did I say that right? Like a reed in the wind. <laughs> Like a weed in there, but you, you can use one. Uh, never mind. You see, beloved, that's why Peter in 1 Peter 5 7 says this. Listen, he says, Casting all your cares upon you. Why, Peter? For he careth for you. I want you to say that. God cares for me. Say it. Say it again. Say it again. Now shout it like you mean it. God cares for me. God cares for you. He's not looking to punish you. He's not looking to starve you. He's not looking for you not to have a roof over your head. He's not looking for you to be sick. That's not what God's doing. God cares for you. Casting all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. You don't cast it on your spouse. You don't cast it on the church. You don't cast it on your boss. You cast it on the Lord. Casting all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. Beloved, so many Christians today, have a problem with an obsessive anxiety that it literally stresses them out and it utterly exhausts them. Now, I've done a lot of counseling over the years. And I don't profess to be a great counselor, but I've seen anxiety firsthand. Because, beloved, it controls their thinking and their thoughts. You see, it controls their decisions and their actions and their reactions and their interactions. And it controls their life, beloved. And it it is always churning somewhere in the back of their subconscious mind and they're not even aware of it a lot of times. But it's bubbling, it's gurgling like that because that's what anxiety does to you. It stresses you out and they're enslaved to it. Would you say amen? They know no other way to live except that way. That's why they're hyper. They're doing this. They're going to do that. I can't settle down. I can't relax. I can't put my feet up. You see, beloved... What's their problem? They're careful about everything. And you hear me now. What, it, what does it do? Well, let me tell you some of the things I've seen. It fills them with fear and nervousness. It fills them with tension and apprehension. It fills them with, fear, you know what I'm saying, with negativity and pessimism. It fills them with worry and paranoia. And beloved folks like this always seem to have an ominous sense of foreboding. In other words, they have some kind of premonition or strong feeling like something is about to happen to them or go wrong in their life at any moment. I just know it. I've made all of these plans. But I know something's going to go wrong. I know Murphy's Law is going to be there. I, know, I, I just know it. Instead of saying, you know what, if it does, it does. God will take care of it. But this is what he wants me to do, and this is what I'm going to do. Amen? Murphy's Law will always, the devil will make sure of that. And beloved, you listen to me. This type of obsessive anxiety is a cruel, hard tyrant and taskmaster in a person's life. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't know how to live without it. And it can affect you emotionally, it can affect you psychologically, and it can affect you physically, beloved. For example, it can cause panic attacks. It can cause heart palpitations. It can cause chest pains. I looked a lot of these things up. It can cause high blood pressure and sleep problems in your life. 
It can cause social disorders, and it can cause both tension and mind-grade headaches, and it can cause stomach and digestive and intestinal problems, and ladies and gentlemen, a host of other such maladies, all because someone will not know, especially a Christian won't trust God, they're careful for everything in their life, and they're filled with worry, and they're filled with fear, and they're filled with anxiety. So they have all of these physical symptoms now manifesting in their life. Because they've not learned how to trust and rest in the Lord. Now Paul knows who he's writing to here. And if I was a Philippian, I would say, sure, Paul. It's, I, and then i think about it, so I can't say that about you because you're in jail right now. And only the Lord knows what they're giving you to eat. Now, beloved, when you're in jail them days, you don't have a bathroom like I have in my... You've got a pot in the corner or a hole in the floor. Now, you can go from there. So I want you to see what it's like. And they may take the very bowl you're using to tinkle in, scrub it out with a little water, and put your food in it. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to eat or not eat? So I, I just, I, I'm not trying to be gross with you, beloved. I'm trying to show you the reality of what Paul's dealing with here. So don't think that your anxiety is more than their anxiety. Because none of us have even experienced close to what we're talking about. Now, beloved, let me say this to you. I am not talking about the kind of common anxiety and nervousness that everyone feels now and then in their life. In other words, beloved, I'm not talking about like when you go and take a test at school. You know, your heart ramps up a little bit. And I'm not talking about when you're going for a job interview or perhaps you're late for an appointment and your heart... Blah, 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 blah. The most feared thing in America when Gala takes a poll is saying to public speak... Your boss says to you, I have a company coming up next week, and I want you to speak to them about what's going on. <gasps> it's like an Indian. <laughs> Your heart's going crazy. Well, but I'm not talking about like when you're going to the doctor or making a dentist appointment. Those aren't the things I'm talking about. We all experience that kind of anxiety. It is normal and natural in our life. I'm talking about abnormal anxiety. I'm talking about atypical anxiety. I'm talking about constant and continuous and overwhelming and overpowering anxiety that may regularly affect you in your life. And beloved, it sticks to you like gum in your shoe and you just can't seem to shake it off unless you're taking some kind of medication from a doctor to be able to help you do it. So when anxiety gets a hold of you, you make sure the devil will drive you crazy. You feel like trying to get gum out of your shoe and you can't do it. You see, beloved, there are many things that can trigger and produce this kind of dreadful anxiety and worry. And I'm only going to name a few because I'm not here to give you a medical counsel. I couldn't do it anyways because I'm not a doctor, a medical doctor. But, beloved, it can be caused by your genetics. It can be caused by mental illness. It, be, it can be caused by bad brain chemistry. A lot of anxiety is caused by personal and family and relational problems and stress that you may have. It can be caused by psychological and emotional problems. It can be caused by feelings of insecurity. And what I've seen as a pastor many times, as you get older, so much of life is out of your control and you get anxious over it. See, we like all our little ducks lined up. This is my plan or whatever, but it gets away from you. And all kinds of... Uh, things intrude into that plan and you can't have it. And what you planned on doing, all of a sudden you just can't do it. And boom, 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 boom. Your heart starts going. Amen. It can be caused by uh, feelings of insecurity. A lot of people feel insecure and they get angry. I don't want anybody to really know what I'm really like. I'm going to put on a show. I'll say, hey, hello, praise the Lord. I looked apart. I don't want them to know what I'm really like. I'm a mad person. I'm an ugly person. I don't want them to know that. Well, I'll put out an air. It's caused by environmental factors and stress and fear of rejection, beloved. A lot of people are afraid to be rejected. Or confrontation. You know the confrontations? I don't, but I'm in them all the time. Fear of a confrontation. And all of a sudden you can't even think straight and you're in an internal struggle. You're imagining, I know what they said. Yeah, I'll tell you right now. They think that. I know they're thinking that. i tell you right now. So you're wrong. <laughs> Beloved, am I, am I telling you the truth? You know that's true, amen? And then you get to talk. You know, most problems are worse in anticipation than reality. Did you know that? I know they're going to do that. And then you go and you go in front of your boss. He says, I just wanted you to know. That job you did the other day, here it comes. I'm going to give you a raise. What? 
Oh, okay. All right. All that wasted fear, all that wasted worry, all that wasted anxiety. Unless you said you're fired. What? <laughs> I'm fired. <laughs> you're the one that hired me. You can't fire me. But you see, beloved, there is a whole plethora and combination of things, and no one really knows what the underlying cause of anxiety really is. That's why it's an individual basis. You have to sit down with them. But I want you to know this. We know for a Christian it can and is caused by demonic attacks and oppression. However, the good news is this. No matter what type of anxiety we have, Paul here shows Christians how we can deal with it and even conquer it with the supernatural power of the Lord, but only if, if, if we do what he says. Not what we feel, what he says. You know, when you, I'm, I was the greatest offender of this because I love to work with my hands, put things together. I'd get something, I said, I know how to put that together. And then I look, and there's three bolts left over and uh, a bracket. And I said, Something's up. Because <laughs> I didn't take the time to do what? Of course, today they're in Chinese, French, German, Spanish, and one little corner American. Put this there. Okay. Same thing is true with God. Same thing is true with dealing with anxiety. God said, I've got a cure for you. I'll show you how to conquer it in your life. But you've got to do it. Now, beloved, listen. Listen to me. Oh. That's point number one. Now, here's the half a point I want to give you, point number two. We've seen about this obsessive anxiety. I want you to see the principles to overcome anxiety. And before I go to you, I'm not going to give you all the principles today, but I'm going to give you a little backdrop to this. This is what I want you to understand. Now, focus, listen to me. Look at me. God is our omnipotent creator. Am I right? How many believe that? Raise your hand. Okay. God is the one who made us. He's the inventor, so to speak. He made the watch. If anybody knows how that watch works, it's who? God. Now, David said in Psalm 139, 14, he says, We are fearfully, wonderfully made. In other words, God made us to be a trichotomous being. In other words, he made us body, soul, and spirit. That's called what kind of a being? A trichotomous being. So man is a complex, multifaceted being. And beloved, there is an interconnection, an interaction between the mind, body, soul, and spirit. How do we know this? Because both personal experience and science has taught us that our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions affect us, good, bad, or indifferent. They affect us emotionally, they affect us physically, they affect us spiritually. Amen? And so what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. God knows how to keep you and I healthy, and he knows how to fix us when we're broken. He's the one that made us in the first place. We are made in his image and likeness. Whatever man has learned, it's only been a scintilla of what God has let him do. So if anybody knows how to touch us, how to heal us, how to fix us when we're broken, certainly it has to be the creator God who made us. What do you think? What do you think, saints? You see, beloved, therefore God knows exactly what we need to thrive and survive and stay healthy. And he knows when you break down, fix you. The question is, will you take the medicine? Will you do what I'm about to tell you to do is what he's saying. If you do, I assure you as your creator, as your maker, as your maker, that it will deliver you from your problem. Now, beloved, listen to me. Now, God often uses in other words, God may lead you or to take medicine, amen? But that's an ordinary means that God would use. That's something the unsaved man can do also. But many times God uses extraordinary means to help and to heal us, amen? And he does it by the supernatural power of his spirit and grace. But listen, through his word and prayer. Now, a lot of people don't have a very high regard for this. I'll read what the medical book says. I'll read what Dr. Phil says. How about reading what Dr. Yehovah says? 
How about reading what the great physician says? You think he knows a little more than Dr. Phil? I like to say Phil would fall right at his feet and grovel if he ever stood in the presence of God. And I, by the way, I understand he's a Christian. I don't know. I don't watch him, but that's the only guy I can think of. <laughs> but, beloved, now get this. I don't want you to miss this. Listen. God supernaturally converts and transforms both our inward spiritual man and our outward physical man. How does he do it, Pastor? Through the supernatural power of his word and his spirit, especially through prayer. Would you say amen? Now think about that a minute. Let it sink down into your mind. With everything you did before you got saved, nothing changed you. But when you believe the word of God, it did. Amen? You listen to me. Even though that's true. In Psalm 19, 7, the Bible says this. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now notice, converting, 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 converting. In other words, it is supernaturally transformative in your life. God's building a house with you. And the house is not being built because you've got a lot of education, or you're so smart, or you've been reading the internet, or you've been reading the social media. He's doing it through the Word of God in your life. He's doing it by the power of His Spirit and grace in your life. Amen? You're going to have a brand new, resurrected, constructed body. How? By the promises of His Word through His Spirit. Would you say amen? You tell me somebody else that can do that. And I want you to follow me, beloved. Yet many have doubt the power and promises and principles of Scripture how it can affect the deeper aspects of our mind in our heart. And they see the Bible as being helpful for some superficial spiritual problems, but they think it's too simplistic and inadequate for the more complex psychological problems of modern men today. So what they do is ignore the Bible and they lean on the arm of flesh. Now let me tell you, when the children of Israel did this, God said to Jeremiah, this is what I want you to write them. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 and 7, Jeremiah said this. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm. In verse 7 he says, But blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, in whose hope the Lord is. King James Version has a kind of twisted there. In whose hope is it, or Lord, okay? But that's what he's saying. One that's always relying on the arm of flesh, God says he's cursed. The other person that says, you know what, Lord, if you want me to lean on the arm of flesh, I'll do it, but you must tell me. I'll trust you. God says you'll be blessed. You see, beloved, people like this that have such a low opinion of Bible, of the Bible, of Scripture, they just read it and think it's just one of the things, I just got to get some examples, whatever. They greatly err, and they do not know what the Bible says God can do for them. The God who created you knows how to fix you. And he will do it through his word for over 2,000 years since the church was born. How did God change men with anxiety and, and murderers? And how did he do it? Tell me how he did it. Through the psychiatrist, through the doctor, through the psychologist, or did he do it through the word of God? See, they had a very high opinion of the word in them days. We don't today, unfortunately. Listen to me, beloved. The best psychology we ever do is give our minds a temporal patch job and modify our external behavior. But it cannot eternally redeem you forever like God's Word can, can it? Beloved, it cannot uh, um, inwardly transform your soul forever like God's Word can. It cannot inwardly, morally, and spiritually regenerate your heart and renew your minds forever like God's Word can. It cannot, beloved, make us new moral and spiritual creatures and creation in Christ inwardly and outwardly forever like God's Word can. Beloved, can you see the miraculous supernatural power of the Word of God? Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. I'll explain that to you later, beloved. You think about it. Your life has been radically renovated. It has been radically changed. How was it done? It was done through the Word of God. The Spirit anointed that Word. And those spirits, beloved, you listen to me. Beloved, God miraculously not only saves us, but listen, 
He promises us the word. He's going to resurrect us and give us eternal life and heaven to boot. <laughs> now, how do you like those apples? Pretty good. I love apples. I believe that's the seed of your strength, uh, David, or the core of your being. Apple. But you see what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? I mean, it's unbelievable. To, no amount of psychology can ever do that for you. No amount of psychiatry or drugs or medication can ever do that for you. No amount of psychoanalysis, psychotherapy can ever do that for you. Psychiatrists themselves say man will start learning how to forgive one another and stop worrying about things. They said, they, this is what they've said, we would have empty offices. But instead, we're going to get down, the guy's going to make a living. Well, see what your problem is, Tom, is when you were a child and beat you with you, all these emotions came up, and because of that, you started acting out this rebellion in your heart. All the, so all through your life, so we need to regress right now and go back to those. And you know what people do? Oh, yeah. You know why? Because they didn't want to admit, I'm wrong. I was wrong to react the way I did. No matter what he did, he's accountable for his actions, and I'm accountable for my reactions. And if I want to be as miserable as him, I just need to do what he's doing. Am I right? Come on, say amen out there. So, beloved, you listen to me. Only the Word of God can change you like that. And it forever changes your mind, beloved. It is a permanent, permanent and a transformative fix in your life. Listen to me. I don't want you to miss this, ladies and gentlemen. God will forever change your mind through His Word. He'll change your thinking, your emotions, your perspective, your character, your soul, your spirit. He changes your eternal destiny, your life, here and here through his word and yet people won't apply it to their lives oh yeah I heard pastor say it he screams he jumps he spits because I'm trying to get it across I'm passionate about it I'm trying to pull the medicine down it. and sometimes people just fight you tooth and nail you listen to me when we through faith believe and obey God's holy and spirit inspired word and have supernatural power built into that word contained in the word is, I've told you before, supernaturally unlocked, unloaded, un unleashed in your life, and it does something. It changes you. It radically changes you. But if you don't believe it and obey it and apply it, it won't be unlocked. It won't be unleashed. It won't be unloaded in your life. You see the supernatural hand of God, the power of God, the power of His Word. And you'll always be in anxiety and freedom always about this and, and, and getting into drugs and getting into alcohol and getting into that. Because you why? Why are you doing it? Because you like alcohol so much? Because you like the taste of it? Or do you like the feel of it? The inebriation, the intoxication, the getting high, the escape for a little bit. What is it? Why is it you drink alcohol? I'll tell you, that's exactly what it is. This is because a lot of people, they go, but they like the effects of it. Why do they take drugs? Same reason. I mean, you see a guy, I just came, I, I I just can't wait to shoot a needle in my arm. That's what I've been waiting for for a long time. I just want to shoot a needle. Well, you want the heroin? No, I just want the needle in my arm. No, what they want is heroin that goes in the needle, the fentanyl goes in there, is to make them what? High. What are they trying to do? They're trying to escape. You see what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? But the problem is, what goes up? It must come down, so what do you do? You do it again. Then your liver, oh, the liver. The liver is the sponge. And it starts absorbing it. Now you need a little bit more fentanyl, a little bit more heroin, a little bit more alcohol, a little strong drink. You see, I'm trying to get high now. I want to get that little buzz now. Or do you want to get delivered from your anxiety and your fear permanently? What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this, that this book, and I'll close in a second, is the operator's manual God has given us. God made us like a wash machine, okay? Here's the manual. We need to read the instructions. And not just read them. You know, my, my refrigerator broke down several weeks ago. I told you about that fiasco. But you know, I read the instruction. I said, well, that's it. I read it. It must fix itself. I would knee deep into this thing, brother. I don't know anything. I don't, I don't like to around with electricity, right? But I'm inside the freezer now. You've got to see this. And I've got a screwdriver 
and I said, I better get one with an insulated handle just in case. And I got the wires on it. And I didn't want to shut off the, the uh, refrigerator because I want to make sure the thing ran. So I went. Then I went. Then I listened. No beeping. And guess what? Didn't work. And I had to call a repairman. But that thing was not going to fix it just by reading it. This is not going to fix you just by reading it. You hear me? It's not going to do it. It won't do it in your life, ladies and gentlemen. You need to put it into practice. Amen. Beloved, listen to me. No other man-made book, no other man-made medicine or counsel or prescription or treatment can ever even remotely compare and match the infallible Word of God in every area and aspect of your life, especially when it comes to overwhelming anxiety in your life. No other book can do it. You need a whole new change of mindset and perspective, and only God can do it. Only God can do it. You've been taught like I was, do this, work hard, blah, 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 do it yourself. yourself. Beloved, you've got to get past that. I mean, I'm not telling you not to do it, but you've got to do what God tells you to do first. Amen? Men have, so, have such a low view of Scripture, beloved Christians that they'd rather trust in man's words and remedies than trust in God's words and remedies. Isn't that true? Well, I see what the doctor says. I see what the psychiatrist says. I see what what God says. I told you, I've got psychologists in my family, and I've gone nose to nose with them. They're saying it's the problems in the head. I'm saying it's in the heart. That child's always in trouble. Why? Because he's rebellion, never broke his spirit. It's your fault, Mom and Dad. You were a hypocrite in your life. Now, if you did that and your son rebels, then give him a whooping for me, too. That's his problem. But if you did what you're supposed to do, beloved, and they saw the consistency in your life, they wouldn't be like that. No, I'm not trying to hurt you. What I'm trying to say to you is God's word goes right to the root. Amen? It goes right to the root. Instead of you trying to love their love and doing what's best for them and easiest for you, do what's right before God and what's best for them, even if they get a little mad at you. So people have a low, a low review, a low view of God's word, and it hurts me no end. Beloved, the scripture says in Psalm 118, 18, now listen, the very center verse in all the Bible, it was the what? The center verse, the middle verse of all the Bible is Psalm 118, 8. You ought to write it down. What does it say, preacher? It says this, that it's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. Did you hear that? Look it up. Didn't I tell you to check me out? It's better, God says, to put your trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. And then he goes on and he says in the next verse about not putting your trust. It's better to trust in the Lord than put your trust in princes. Am I right, Tom? You're looking at it now? About time you did something. Next week, I'm going to, or week after, I'm going to give you specific principles that Paul shows us here on how he can help us overcome anxiety, but they'll only work if you will practice them. Now, beloved, I said it before, but I'll say it again. I'll close with this. A lot of people think when they become a Christian that it's over with. Now you're in the body of Christ and your growth is just normal. Whether you study or study, obey or don't obey, it's just gonna, you're just going to grow as a Christian. That's not true, though, see? It's going to take you getting to work, putting those principles into practice. Anything in life, how did you learn the computer? One time, read, well, I read the direction. I didn't understand a word they said. It was all lingo. I didn't understand any of the lingo. They said the mouse. I don't have any mouse around here. And then somebody told me, the mouse is the thing you go like this with. I said, I think I go like this with my hand. <laughs> I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Our Father and our God, we thank you.